Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to spend some time with you just explaining to you how we use stem cells in orthopedic surgery. We've been using stem cells in the muscle skeletal system for the last 12 years, and we started focusing initially on cartilage regeneration, but over time we found that we can actually treat the other aspects of the muscle skeletal system. The problem started when we had issues with cartilage. So we focused our stem cell on cartilage and we realized that current technology, the results are very inconsistent. You have donor site problems. If you use autologous chondrocyte implantation, a lot of them involve open surgery and ACI Macy is actually very, very expensive. And a lot of this technology do not replace the normal hyaline cartilage. It actually replaces that with fibrocartilage, which you can see on histology is totally different than your hyaline cartilage. It doesn't treat kissing lesions. It's good for small lesions, but not good for large lesions. So for many years, what I've been doing is drilling into those lesions, give them some HA, and I know I get fibrocartilage. And about 15 years ago, we thought, can we improve that? Can we drill? Can we give HA plus stem cells and then regenerate hyaline cartilage, which is what a preferred cartilage is? So the answer is yes now. This is what I'd like to share with you. We term this our biological implant, where we arthroscopically drill into the lesion. It could be bone and bone lesions. We then harvest the stem cells, patient's own stem cells, inject into the joint and reverse the pathology. Now, these are the principles of chondrogenesis that we adhere to. If you stick to those principles, you can treat most joints to rebuild good articular cartilage. So I'd like to give you the background about the, how we evolve in our surgical technique. So this lady presented to us back in 2007. She's actually a Scottish lady um, who had multiple surgery done to her knee. And as you can see, she's got very bad patellofemoral joint. So she was like my fifth patient. And I told her, look, I can try this. I've done animal work. It works extremely well, but we'll try this. Otherwise, she's been offered a total knee replacement at 34 years old. So we drill arthroscopically into the patellofemoral joint, give her stem cells, and two years later, we could see a good articulation in the joint. And when I had a chance of taking a look into the second look arthroscopy, we realized that in the early days, we followed Richard Stateman's technique, is that you microfracture three to five millimeter apart. So we drill three to five millimeter apart. And second look arthroscopy showed that we saw the individual tufts of cartilage. But when we biopsy those individual tufts of cartilage, we realize that these are beautiful cartilage, which is full of collagen type 2, minimal collagen type 1, and a lot of safranin. Oh, and these are all features of good articular cartilage. And in the tibial plateau, we could see that even at two years, the drill holes are full of chondrocytes ossifying into bone. And when we magnify those areas, they're all full of chondrocytes, a lot of safranin O, and a lot of collagen type 2. So we postulated that in uncontained lesion, these are bone-on-bone -bone lesions, when we drill, the, the cartilage must be coming from the drill hole. So it has to come from the drill hole and grow from the drill hole, and then we see individual tufts of cartilage. So by definition, if we then drill closer together, we should get better articular cartilage regeneration. So this is the evolvement of the uh, surgical technique. So we published this paper, in 2011, I showed that we can now regenerate articular hyaline cartilage by just doing arthroscopic drilling followed by post-op stem cells plus HA. So not until 2016, I had good evidence. This is another patient that we did uh, previous surgery and we had a chance of having a look second look arthroscopy because he had further injury. And we could now see that the individual tufts of cartilage and certain areas may grow faster than others so certain areas you see individual tufts of cartilage and then other areas with a bit more time or earlier cartilage regeneration, you get a nice confluence of articular cartilage. So the principles that we have is that we drill or we burr 5 to 10 millimeter depth and leave a bit of gap, about 1 mm and a bit of burring in between. You need to correct the alignment. If somebody is virus or valgus, you need to think of thinking of osteotomy. If they got associated ACL injury, PCL injury, you need to think about correcting those injuries. The viability of cells are very important. And we mix the peripheral blood stem cell with HA. We started with intra-articular injection once a week for five weeks, and then we follow on with more injections six months and beyond. 
Now, the rehab protocol is also extremely important. Now, think about this now. If you drill into the joint, and each drill hole gives you one tuft of cartilage, what you want to do is that you want to drill more because that tuft of cartilage has to take load. So what you want to do is that you want to lie on a bed of nails and rather than two nails. So you want to have you know, more drillings that give you more tufts of cartilage. I think that, that's the important part of it. Otherwise, that cartilage will break down and then you are back to square one again. Okay? And in the patellofemoral joint, we do exactly the same thing. Even the patellofemoral joint, you must remember, there's a lot of shearing forces there. Otherwise, it starts breaking down. So by doing an ideal drilling, we now use this clinically and we do very close drilling. This is a, a middle compartment disease and you can see very good articular cartilage regeneration. Now the second part of this concept is that you need multiple injections and that's the key, multiple injections. Stem cells has got the capability of differentiating into different tissues. Now, the stem cell we're using is actually peripheral blood stem cells, autologous cells, by giving them GCSS stimulation. So this is the apheresis process that we do. Um, we, our radiologist will put a line in a vein, and after we're stimulating with GCSF, this centrifuge machine will harvest the stem cells, and then in our lab at KLSMC, we will mix it with antifreeze, and then keep it in liquid nitrogen in 4 ml syringes. So this peripheral blood stem cells is not something new, it's something that the hematologist has been doing for many years for bone marrow transplant. And it's been shown to be multipotent progenitor cell, long track record, and it's very safe, and it's actually autologous cells. Our innovation is actually use this existing technology on articular cartilage and bone and soft tissue regeneration. So back in 2005, we started animal work to have a proof of concept and we worked with UPM in a GOAT study where we created a defect, took a bone marrow cells, and then we had three groups, the control group we gave nothing, the second group we gave HA, and you can see that histology is a bit better, but the group that we give stem cells plus HA, we have beautiful articular cartilage with collagen type 2, very minimal collagen type 1, and a lot of suffering in O, and chondrocytes. So this paper was published in 2009, and it showed that when you give stem cell plus HA, you can regenerate a better articular cartilage. And in 2010, we embarked on a randomized control trial, uh, which is partially funded by uh, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. And we had two groups that we did surgery. One group, we just give HA. The other group, we give HA plus uh, stem cells. So we use MRI scan to chart that uh, growth of the cartilage. And also, uh, you can see with the biopsy as well, putting on the 14 parameters of the ICRS, we then looked at the histology. Now, this group with just HA alone, there's no um, growth of any collagen type 2 at all. Lesser suffering O as well, a lot of collagen type 1, so which is basically fibrocartilage. And the ones with collagen type 2 is only present in the group that we give uh, HA plus peripheral blood stem cells. So without stem cells, we are unable to show any evidence of collagen type 2 regeneration, which is the collagen that we wanted. So we published this paper in 2013 uh, uh, that showed that results. Now, when we started looking back into our histology, because you know, for many years we've done 100 over histology, and we started looking at it and looking at why certain cases has got better collagen type 2 and some has got lesser. So we started looking at our histology and compared to a normal cartilage, which if you think about it, it is 100%. Now, the group that we've done the randomized control trial we give once a week for five weeks and six months later, we give one a week for three weeks. And the histology is about 70%. When we started combining it with stem cells, we find that it's a bit better, histology is about 80%. And when we look at patients that we combine high TB osteotomy, we give multiple injections um, once a week for five weeks and six monthly, 12 monthly, up to 18 months, and some even beyond, we're getting now histology approaching 95% of a normal article cartilage cost. So we think this is what's happening. So with the cartilage damage, we will remove damaged cartilage, surrounding cartilage. We do a bit of a light bill burring into the area. And then arthroscopically, we'll drill into the area, drill deep into the bone. And by doing that, you have a blood clot scaffold. And that's the scaffold that we need. We do not need any external scaffold. 
and the drilling causes an injury, you get migration of endogenous stem cells into the area, and when we injected the stem cells into the joint, we think then you have more stem cells into the joint that promote the healing process. As time progresses, we get initial um, cartilage regeneration, and then we gave booster shots at about six months. Okay, so at six months we give them booster shots, and with what's present in the stem cells, the growth factors, and everything inside there, we think it mobilizes more cells from the endogenous area, and then eventually regenerate the whole layer of articular cartilage which we've shown before. Now, the final part of this jigsaw puzzle is actually load bearing and rehab, which is actually crucial. Okay? So we started looking at this, this lady had a virus knee, so we did an osteotomy and also drilling the cartilage and you can see this is like 12 years ago, our drilling is still quite far apart, but even then we managed to get good articular cartilage and when we biopsy those areas, we found that the medial femoral condyle and medial tibial plateau, we get fantastic histology. But the intercondylar notch that I did the Brightman there, and we saw that cartilage that didn't look that bad, but we did a histology in the area, is actually lesser collagen type 2 and a lot of collagen type 1, because the notch area that we've done actually do not have any load bearing. So non-weight bearing, gives you poorer articular cartilage. Okay, so we learned that many years ago that load bearing is actually very important. The other thing that we, we realized is that a lot of our patients that we drill the tibial plateau and medial femoral condyle or lateral femoral condyle, it heals extremely well because it's loading all the time. So if you drill those areas, you're walking, you're loading all the time. The problem is if you drill over the patellofemoral joint, in the early days we had problems because the results are very inconsistent. So we were just thinking, why is that inconsistent in the patellofemoral joint? And we started looking at that. You do not get loading if your knee is extended when you're walking. So the patellofemoral joint do not have any loading unless you flex the knee. Okay? So we started a physiotherapy regime that patients do static loading at different range depending on where the cartilage lesion is. But we do exactly the same thing when the cartilage breaks down in the patella femoral joint, we will drill the patella and also the trochlear. And by doing that, we initially start with a bit of loading CPM. As the cartilage starts to grow, we then increasing the loading. And as it gets better and better, we start putting on a cycling machine. And as the cartilage even gets better, we start increasing the resistance of the cycling machine. And judging by that, and we can rebuild good articular cartilage in the patella femoral joint. So this patient had a high TP osteotomy, a lateral patella mouth tracking, and damage to the patella femoral joint. So we did an arthroscopic lateral patella release, and we drilled a lateral patella facet. You can see good articular cartilage there. And the trochlea is actually a big lesion as well, and good articular cartilage regeneration. And what I realized is that the central trochlea, somehow or other, there's lesser cartilage there. So I started thinking, why is that? And if you think about it, if you drill the lateral patella femoral joint, you get more loading in the lateral patella femoral joint as the cartilage grow, but the medial, the central trochlea has got less loading. So again, less loading, less cartilage regeneration. What do we do with osteochondritis dissecans? This patient is symptomatic, a 22-year-old, a British um, a boy, and you can see we remove that fragment there and then we just drill, we don't have to bone graft in this technique, so we just drill deep into that, and you can see early uh, uh, cartilage regeneration there, and with the T2 mapping as well, uh, cartilage regeneration. But notice that the posterior aspect of it is less cartilage because he was not loading enough, he was not keeping his knee flexed enough. So we got him to flex more, and eventually the posterior aspect of the cartilage started to heal. Oats. This is a patient of mine who had um, an Oates transplant and um, he, is American. he had it done in the States and you can see it was good for six months, it broke down and there were three cylinders of, of, of cartilage that I removed and by then he had femoral condyle and tibial plateau cartilage injury. So we drilled deep into those areas there, give them stem cells and you can see two years later the bone heals up and also the articular cartilage. Now, how does the stem cell do that? How does the, the body does that? I don't know. 
When does it know when to form bone? And when you finish forming bone, it forms cartilage and forms all the layers. I don't know how that works, but it works. Okay? So we, in 2015, we published this paper that we do a, a combination of uh, patients with a virus deformity. So what we do, we do an osteotomy and then we do uh, cartilage regeneration by drilling into the tibial plateau and femoral condyle. So arthroscopically, we drill into the area and then harvest stem cells, inject into the joint, mix it with HA. And by doing that, as I said, we, we are able to show that we can regenerate all the layers of articular cartilage. So this patient is, you can see, four years post-op, there's good articular cartilage regeneration, and pre-op is actually bone on bone. And we biopsy those areas, you can see cartilage regeneration, and also on T2 mapping, the new cartilage is a lot younger, seems a lot better. And this is intraoperative view after drilling, and two years later, good articular cartilage, both in the femoral condyle and tibial plateau. And we biopsy those areas, you can see a lot of collagen type 2, almost absence of collagen type 1, and a lot of suffering. And these are all features showing good articular cartilage and using histology with 14 parameters of ICRS, the cartilage cost now approaches 95% of a normal cartilage cost now. So in a 50-year-old, we find that the, the normal cartilage is not 100% anyway. So a 95% works extremely well. So this is a patient of mine, 56 years old, you can see he's got bilateral knee and did not want any knee replacement. So when patients have got bilateral virus knee, I tend to do stage procedures. So I do a high TP osteotomy for them on both knees first. When I take out the metal and then regenerate the cartilage for them. So this patient, as you can see, um, even when I plan to, to, to correct it to neutral, but the center of gravity is still slightly virus there. That's because we have not regenerated the cartilage. So when I, when I took out the metal, I started drilling at the same sitting. And you can see a year later, you get articular cartilage regeneration. And the best part about this is that the center of gravity moved back to the middle. So if you do not have good articular cartilage, there's no way that a middle compartment, which is bone on bone, will then form cartilage and throw the center of gravity back to the middle. So as you can see, this is good articular cartilage that enables you to do that. Now in the past, we're now doing osteotomy below tibial tuberosity, okay? And we used to do some fibular osteotomy, but now we've, we've abandoned that. We just do a pure below tibial tuberosity osteotomy, which I can share with you um, um, if you're interested. Now, this is a patient of mine from Singapore. He's got very virus knee with an ACL deficient knee. Um, so we did an osteotomy for him. I think we corrected about 14 degrees. And again, we did it opening wedge first and give him stem cells and then drill the trochlear and the middle compartment, put in a new ACL for him using an allograph. And you can see that's a regeneration of the middle compartment. Uh, the patellar femoral joint is a huge defect that regenerated and also the allograph has healed up nicely. So this is pre-op and this is six months. And as time progresses, when we took out the metal, regenerated the cartilage, you can see the center of gravity again move back to the middle because you've got good articular cartilage there. And that's the final picture that you can see. Now in 2013, we started talking about other aspects of the muscle skeletal system that we can apply uh, stem cells. So this is an ankle joint. A patient had a lot of pain there, so we drilled into the ankle joint. Quite a large defect there. And eventually that healed up extremely well. Patellar tendinitis, um, a real problem. What we do is a bit different. Um, we, we do it under sedation and we will needle the patellar tendon deep, okay, all the way, and then put the stem cells mixed with HA and inject into the tendon itself. And you can see this is one of my professional footballers who's got a torn ACL as well. So we fix the ACL and, and this tendon reverses at as early as six weeks. Tennis elbow, we can do exactly the same thing. This one is a big lesion, so this is Dr. Ranji's patient, and we drill into the area and then give him stem cell, and that healed up three months. And bad Achilles tendonitis, we do exactly the same thing. We needle into that. We want to create an injury. When you create an injury, the stem cell will then home into the injury and repair the tissue and repair and regenerate those tissues. This is my Australian patient who's got this fancy tattoo. He's like the Aquaman. And um, 
He turned up, he's an ex-boxer, he's got a glenoid injury, a lot of pain. And back in Australia, they told him, if it's bad enough, then we'll do a shoulder replacement for you. And I arthroscoped him and I drilled his, his um, glenoid. And eight months later, his cartilage healed up. He's now two years post-stop and he's gone back to boxing now. And, and you can see we did arthro everything arthroscopically and we've not um, damaged his tattoo at all. Now, a combination of ACL and, and MCL injury, we tend now to just use stem cells to heal the MCL. And you'd be surprised by injecting once a week for three to five weeks, the MCL will be very stable by four to six weeks. And then we go and fix the ACL reconstruction using an allograft. So this patient also had a, a chondrolesion in the patellofemoral joint. You can see the ACL the healing up, a hypertrophy, and also regeneration of the patellofemoral joint. I use it for Elizrof as well, and this gentleman has got a varus knee, a shortened leg. So this amount of callus formation is only one week after stem cell injections. You get so much callus um, formation just one week. Now, intrasubstance meniscus tear, sometimes they don't do well, it's symptomatic. So we do, again, arthroscopic needling into the area and then inject stem cells. You can see one year and three years later, that's healed up extremely nicely. Some of you may know Nick. Nick Geary is actually a foot and ankle surgeon from the UK. He was actually my boss. In 1990, I was his registrar. He was my consultant. And he came in 2012 because he had skiing injury, he had bone and bone lesion, and he had recurrent effusion, he couldn't ski. And you can see he's got lateral compartment, they took away his meniscus, part of his meniscus, and was, he's got patellar maltracking, he's got you know, a lateral patellar defect and trochlear defect. So we drilled him, gave him stem cells, and he got better at five months, he got, and we got him back to skiing 14 months later. And I can tell you it's very tough operating on your old boss, because if it goes wrong, you get into trouble. Now, um, in the last 12 years or so, we've done about 850 cases now. And a lot of cases actually involve patellofemoral joint, multiple you know, large lesion. Some of it is combined with ACL. Some of them complex. But the, the small isolated lesions is only like 6%. The important thing is actually safety data. And we've been looking at our data. And we wanted to know whether we get adverse problem, any soft tissue tumor, bone tumors. We're bringing back our patient after five years and 10 years to look at the results, to just to make sure that we don't have any of these issues there. And luckily to date, we have none of this to report. Now, so as an arthroscopic surgeon, I obviously like to do things arthroscopically. The wish list is that we can do this arthroscopically. We can then deal with it. Osteochondral defects, we can drill with it. We can now deal with Kissing lesions, we have a single procedure. We don't need any scaffold, simple delivery by injections. But more importantly, you have good articular cartilage, which is very important, which is resilient. Let's just mention a bit about our US um, FDA trial that we're currently running. Um, we started our US FDA trial, a uh, phase 2B in 2016 in January in Malaysia. Dr. Reza is actually our principal investigator. And also, the second site was actually at the Andrews Institute in Florida. And this is unmet medical needs because we are talking about massive cartilage lesions. This is uh, James Andrews on my right-hand side, and then Dr. Adam Enns, who is actually the principal investigator at the Andrews Institute there. Now, our inclusion criteria involved must be one lesion more than three centimeters squared. So we're not taking less than two centimeters squared because microfracture is amenable for, for lesion theoretically less than two centimeters. So when it's more than two centimeters squared, microfracture results are not so good. So we're taking lesions more than three centimeters squared and we'll take on any failed cartilage procedure. So if it's a failed microfracture, failed ACI, failed you know, oats, we will take on all these cases there. So long as we do not need to do any osteotomy or ligament reconstruction. And now we have um, 24 month results now, and when we look at our primary efficacy, IKDC and cool scores, they're all now statistically significant. So for example, this 52-year-old lady has bone on bone lesion, uh, lateral tibial plateau, lateral femoral condyle, big lesion, more than three centimeters squared that we drill. You can see even the middle femoral condyle has got lesions, and so is the patellar femoral joint. So it's actually a tricompartmental problem that we drill. You know, the early data suggests that this technology is safe, we can treat massive cartilage lesions with improvement of clinical and radiological scores. 
Now, last week we had some good news um, from our clinical research organization, and with the Data Safety Monitoring uh, Committee, they've looked at our results, interim analysis, and said that we have done enough now, the results are so statistically significant now, they've advised us that we should stop recruiting any more patients for this trial, and we're now in the process of talking to FD and see how we can finish this trial and move on to a phase three, doing exactly the same thing. So this is Dr. Reza, he presented his paper and also presented our paper last year at APOA meeting. Now, if you look at the IKDC scores, and these are the scores for patient 18 to 65, that is the normal IKDC scores for average of individuals, okay? Now, the yellow one is on patients who are having IKDC scores and they are ready for a total knee replacement. So if you look at microfracture, they're a bit better and then they deteriorate again. And uh, ACI, they better and they slowly deteriorate. When we look at our long-term data, our long-term data up to about 11, 12 years now, they're still maintaining. And our FDA trial patients, again, they start from bad lesion. Some of them are ready for a total knee replacement and you can see that they are continuing to improve. And we find that patients that we do stem cells, they continue to improve from two years, three years, four years, they continue to improve. Now, if you think about microfracture, I mean, a lot of people do microfracture. Yes, both are arthroscopic surgery, but we do microdrilling. A microfracture, you just pick it, you pick three to five millimeter apart, and you don't go deep enough, okay? So it's too shallow and, and too far apart. Whereas when we do micro drilling, we do very close drilling, we go deep drilling because I think drilling deep into the marrow is actually very important. Microfracture has got no cells and a lot of people who do microfracture don't even give them HA post-op. So if you drill and we give HA, they are much better than microfracture or drilling without HA, okay? And we give stem cells. Microfracture standard is non-weight bearing for six weeks. And as you can see, we start weight bearing the day after surgery because it's very important to weight bear initially. So what we do, we do with our physiotherapist, we get uh, a weighing machine and patient sits down and they put pressure and they say, okay, I'm going to put 10 to 15 kg of pressure and then increasing that to sometimes full weight bearing at six to eight weeks. So with a weighing machine, you can judge that, okay? And we have a specialized physio with loading and CPM and everything. So if you look at what the stem cells do, if you have an injury, the stem cells, the innate nature of the stem cell is that it home into the area of injury and with the functional stimulation, it then differentiate into different tissue. What about limitations? How large a defect can we treat? You know, uh, can, we know we can treat bone and bone lesion. Can we drill the whole joint? Uh, we know if you fix the cartilage, theoretically, we're able to delay osteoarthritis. And are we able to reverse osteoarthritis? So these are the questions that we have at the moment. I'd like to then show some clinical cases now. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Mr. David Haverkamp, who is here. He presented to me about three, four years back and with an ankle like that, okay? We did an MRI scan. Um, it's full of cysts, okay? Now, David has had multiple trauma. I think he's had a bad accident and then you know, injured the shoulder, broken some ribs, had some nail into the femur and tibia, and had multiple ankle surgery as well, is that right? So can you just tell us about you know, what, what, when you came, you had a lot of pain, and, and what were your mobility like and everything? Yeah, certainly, um, <clears throat> the uh, trauma that Dr. Saul uh, explained was from a motorcycle accident when I was in university day, so quite a few years ago, and about I had some mobility after the accident, but it was degenerating year after year. About 25 years after the accident, I finally lost cartilage in my ankle. And um, every step hurt. Yep. Um, I used ibuprofen daily as a wonder drug. <laughs> and uh, I went to the best doctors in uh, Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, and they said, nothing we can do for you. We cannot regenerate the cartilage. And um, so I was literally waiting for medical science to catch up with the issue. And I was living here in KL and found KL Sports Medicine, Dr. Saul, and decided to give it a try. <clears throat> I was two years, two months ago. Yeah, so, you know, I, I explained to David that, look, we can theoretically drill a whole joint. 
it took him a year to decide whether you know he's willing to have this surgery or not so anyway this over two years ago we did that uh, we arthroscopy drilled the whole ankle joint as you can see the talus and the distal end of the tibia we drilled the whole ankle joint and this is the pre-op x-ray that he has and this is now the recent x-ray and MRI scan that we took for him at 24 months and the MRI scan showed a good cartilage regeneration there. Can you just tell us you know, what's the journey been like and, and how's it been? Is your ankle better now? Well, you used to have a stick for a long time. Oh, much better. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot to the physical therapist also. It, um, they're very rigorous. <clears throat> Cause a lot of pain, but in the end it helps. How far can you walk now? Uh, according to my telephone, um, previously, prior to surgery, every step hurt. Now, no pain at all, eight, 10,000 steps a day. Um, according to my telephone, um, with good shoes. Uh, I still will use, I've gone on hikes, 20,000 steps. Um, no, no, no bad effects afterwards. Um, right, so after surgery, I was on two crutches for about four months. One crutch I really used a lot, about four months after that. Then a cane for another four months, about a year. And then I started weaning myself off of it. Um, Still improving, yeah. Yeah, it, it continues to improve. That's a good thing, you know. David also had enough courage for me to drill his shoulder. So he said he's going to be in Malaysia for the next two years. Um, can we now try to think about what to do for your shoulder? I said, yeah, I've got the Australian guy that I did. You know, he got better. Um, so about so five weeks ago, um, we arthroscope. You can see he's got, his whole glenoid is gone. He's got some damage to the humeral head. So this is the whole glenoid um, from the superior view. I drilled the whole glenoid there and did some drilling over the humeral head as well, the kissing lesion. So the physiotherapy now involves um, loading into those areas. The glenoid is easy because the glenoid is always loaded, but the part of the humeral head, and do you know which part that you need to be loading on that? <laughs> yeah, I'm reminded every day. So the physiotherapy know which angle he needs to be loading and he has to load into the area because when you're not loading into the area, you're not going to regenerate the um, articular cartilage at all. So this is still early days. Maybe two years later, we can, we can show them the results of cartilage regeneration. But I, I, I think you'll be fine. You know, I'm not worried about it because I think the cartilage will grow because he's got good stem cells. Thanks, David. So that's the drilling post-stop. You can see all the drill holes there. This other lady from the UK came here to KL beginning of last year because she had a septic ankle and as you can see, it's eroded all her cartilage and for three years she was suffering. And you can see that was pretty bad. So we drilled the whole ankle joint as well. And this is pre-op. And this six months later, you can see evidence of cartilage regeneration and was as early as two months, most of her pain is gone. And at that time, prior to surgery, she was taking a lot of brufen and everything and, and had a lot of night pain. But as early as two months, most of her pain is gone and she's now almost a year post-stop. And she's had, coming back for further stem cell injections. And you can see uh, this is the regenerated cartilage at six months. Can you just tell us how you sustain your injury? doing box jump and then I just dislocated my kneecap. Uh, it went back in but then it was really loose and it was coming out every time I bend my knee. So what happened was um, she presented with that and, and a patella kit on you know, dislocating, subluxating there. And she had prior surgery um, before she came to see me and we did emergent view and the patella was still dislocated there. You have an MPFL injury there's also quite a big chunk of cartilage that's come off there. And when you do an arthroscopic surgery, you can see that the patella is actually maltracking there. And so we drill into the medial and the lateral compartment. I do arthroscopic lateral release for her. And if you do a lateral release, once you finish with the lateral release, you must be at least able to tilt the patella to about 60 degrees. So if that's a lateral release, if your patella is like that, after you do a lateral release here, you should be able to tilt your patella about 60 degrees. Otherwise, it's not enough lateral release. 
Okay? Don't worry about the lateral release because it will heal if you do it properly. So I, I try to, to explain why I do this. Um, so you can see the lateral release that's done there. And the MPFL is actually quite a slender ligament there. And what I do is that I do plication of this rather than using an allograft, putting screw, fixation with hamstrings or whatever. And for many years I've been doing that. I find that it heals extremely well. And you can do everything arthroscopically. So all she had is a, is a small transverse incision over the medial side of her patella. And then what we did was we put sutures, okay? And what we do is that we put fiber wire. So with a, with a suture, you can see the ends of the fiber wire here. And I arthroscopically, I went from, went from the bottom here and, and, and pull it through. So we pull the suture through the fiber wire. And then what I do is that I tunnel over the skin, I tunnel down and pick up the other suture. Okay, through the same incision, and then I pull it up. Okay, so you can, you can have three of these sutures, and you can see those three sutures there. But the important thing is that when you plicate, you need this to heal up as well. So what I do in between is that I needle in between that. Okay, in between those sutures, I needle in between those sutures there, so there are lots of needling into the area, because when you plicate, when you have an injury, that area will heal. Okay. So that's what we've done. And when you pull it together, the patella then will move medially. Okay? So you can see this is um, before the plication, and this is after plication. You can see the, the, the area of bone that's defective there, which is because of the, of the drilling there. Okay? So at 18 months, this is the MRI that we X-ray and MRI we just took recently. The patella is now stable, and you can see the drilling post-op. This is the drilling at 18 months. You can see a bit of hypertrophy still, but that will eventually, you know, flatten down. And this is post-op. Okay, you can see the the MPFL is a bit thickened there, a bit inflamed there. So the MPFL is there, and this is the drilling of the patella. And that cartilage is regenerating. She's now 18 months, so it's not fully healed yet. And that's the lateral release. Now, the thing about this is that this lateral retinaculum, when you put stem cells, it heals up extremely well, as though nothing has happened to that. Okay? But if you just do a lateral release without stem cells, you just get a thin layer of tissue. So you must imagine that that layer eventually forms very nicely and then you still have your check rein for your patella to glide nicely. So post-op initially, we put some padding, we push the patella medially and initially we warn her that if you have a lateral release, sometimes the knee will click, okay? That happens for first three months, is that right? It clicks for a while and then when the retinaculum starts healing up, the patella then tracks nicely. So if you do a lateral release, you must always warn the patient about that. You're now 18 months. How's, uh, how's the knee feel? Um, uh, it feels great. At least I could get back to some light exercises. I think that's probably something that I'm looking to get back to. Yeah. And, and I ask her to cycle every day if she can. I find that with a patellar femoral joint, if you cycle 10-20 minutes every day, it makes so much difference for the cartilage regeneration. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> So the rider, he was in the finishing line, he was, he was leading, and then he was knocked over and he glided across, and the other bike just went through the middle of his tibia. So he came to us, he was initially admitted to GH, and obviously it's an open uh, fracture. And I told them that, look, we'll, we can try to use stem cell to rebuild the bone, okay? And so we grafted him first, uh, he had a lot of soft tissue injury, and also he had an MRSA infection. So we had a bit of a problem dealing with the MRSA, which is not one, something that we like to have. And so I wanted to do a bicortical trans transport. You can see in the top, I did an osteotomy. I wouldn't do a bicortical transport, but the soft tissue on top was just not good enough. So I just did a distal transport. So I did an osteotomy distally and started to, to, to do that. And every few weeks, I gave him stem cells, okay, into the osteotomy side, into the bone regenerated side, okay. Now, the other thing is that because you are transporting such a 
huge chunk of bone, he had, you know, equinovirus deformity. So I wanted to just release that, and we released that. Otherwise, you know, the foot got worse and worse, and we released that for him. And this is what I put a arthroscope inside there, an endoscope, and you can see this is the top of the bone, and that's the junction of that, and that's the middle of that, and that's a regenerating bone. And it's very interesting. This is like a sponge. You know, when I probed it, it's exactly like a sponge, that tissue. So that regenerative bone is like, so we injected stem cells intermittently for him. And so eventually we docked it over there. And um, this is a picture that's taken just on Wednesday, okay? And that's solid now. He's got no signs of any infection. And that was him uh, walking in the clinic. He still has a ACL and an MCL injury that needs to be addressed. Now, he equinus virus foot, um, Dr. Lo, our foot and ankle surgeon, we did some open surgery and corrected that for him. Otherwise, he could not walk at all. Let's go back again. Kissing lesions we can treat, we can micro-drill the whole joint. I've drilled some knees, 80% of the knee, and they do well, okay? And definitely, we can delay osteoarthritis, and perhaps, you know, with the results are sustainable enough, we can say that we can also reverse osteoarthritis. So, if you can see, day to day, we are treating a lot of patients, not rare problems, okay? A lot of common problems, and we're using their own stem cell, autologous cells, very safe, multiple applications, and a lot of potential for that.